Hi, physics students, and welcome to um, video 9.2, which is a revisitation of single slit diffraction. Remember, we talked about this before, where we quantified, uh, actually, we didn't quantify, but we talked about the three variables being important in single slit, slit diffraction. Number one, the wavelength of the light. Number two, the width opening, little b. And number three, um, the angle of that, of that, uh, the width, the angular width of that fringe on the screen. Okay, so we're going to revisit those, and I'm going to actually quantify um, and come up with an equation for you. The big difference between the higher level treatment and the standard level treatment of this topic is that you higher level kids are meant to work quantitatively with it. So I'm going to give you the equation, whereas before we just talked qualitatively about it. Fortunately for you, the mathematics is quite simple. Um, it's more just the conceptual notions that you're going to have to really focus on, okay? All right, so recall what diffraction is. Diffraction is the, is the spreading out of waves as they either go around an obstacle or through an aperture or opening, okay? And we saw before that we get um, very little or no diffraction when the opening, B, is much, much, much wider than the wavelength, okay? If B and the wavelength are, are on the same order of magnitude or very, very close together, you're going to get much more diffraction. And remember, this holds for all waves, obstacles, and openings. And we, we talked um, at length about why you can hear through a doorway or around a doorway, but why you can't see through it or, or see around it, okay? So sound diffracts through a doorway because the average opening of a doorway, which is about a meter, is about the same as the, sound, as the wavelength of a sound wave, whereas light waves are much, much, much smaller, okay? Um, so before, um, you only needed to um, qualify single slit diffraction patterns, now you're going to have to quantify them, okay? All right, so we've seen all this before. We've seen with water waves how there's a diffraction pattern on the other side of the, on the, on the far wall. With, uh, with light, you see a central maximum along this axis that goes right through the slit opening B, okay? So the same patterns hold for water as for light, as for any other kind of wave. So this is really cool sort of uh, universal stuff here, okay? So I'm going to derive for you the equation for the first minimum, okay? Now, remember um, what, the, what the image looks like. We've seen this in class before, okay? Um, only the center fringe is a very strong fringe, a very bright one. The bright fringes on either side, what they do is they get dimmer as they get farther away from the center. And we talked about how we have a zeroth order, bright fringe, first order, second order, third order, etc. cetera, okay? Um, when, when, when we talked about double slits, okay? So the same idea of an integer counter of n from zero to one, two, three, four, et cetera, holds here. I'm gonna re revisit that in this video in just a minute. Okay, so the important variables to consider. We said that number one was the angle between the center line and the maximum minimum lines, okay? Now, you see how I have this um, theta defined from the center of the first maximum to the center of the first minimum or the, or the next maximum, okay? Sometimes you see it, um, I guess it's more customary to see this dashed line right here, um, right in the middle of the first minimum. It doesn't really matter that much, but when we do problem solving, that's how we're going to assume uh, theta to be actually half the width of the central of the center bright fringe, okay? The slit opening is little b, as we referred to before, and the wavelength of light is just lambda, okay? So these are the three important variables that we're gonna consider, okay? So I wanna go back a little bit to, to why does diffraction even happen? Well, in 1690, a, uh, a Dutch physicist named Christian Eugens came up with an idea, which is now known as Eugens' principle. And what he said was, well, if we treat the slit as an infinite number of sources, okay? So in this case, we have five little, what he called wavelets, like little individual waves, okay? The overall result is the addition or superposition of all of those sources on the screen. It turns out that in the forward direction along this axis right here, um, all of those little wavelets are actually in phase. So they, they add up to give a, a perfect maximum intensity, okay? Where the angle theta would be zero in that case, okay? So you're gonna have a, a central bright fringe here, right? Because of that, okay? Um, so he did a lot, there's a lot more to it than this. This is a super simple version of it, but that essentially um, explained at the time and still explains the phenomenon of diffraction of light through a single slit or a diffraction of any sort of wave through any sort of aperture, okay? At any other angle, there's going to be a path difference between the rays, of course, that depends on the angle um, theta, and we've seen this when we talked about quantifying double slit diffraction, okay? So if the path difference, of course, 
is, um, is one half the wavelength between any pair, you're going to have destructive interference because that, in those places the phase difference is pi. So you have a crest lining up with a trough and vice versa. Okay, So you can see here in this diagram on the right, we have five different wavelets depicted. Wavelets 1 and 3 will interact destructively because the path difference L1 and L2 between them is lambda over 2, wavelength over 2. 3 and 5 will also interact destructively because L1 minus L2 is, um, is lambda over 2. 1 and 5 will actually interact constructively. You see that? So it depends on which pairs you're taking, all right? Um, so the distance between each of these 1 and 3 and 3 and 5, the distance between those is actually, of course, one half of this distance B, as you can see geometrically. So the condition for the first minimum is that the angle must make all the sources across the slit cancel out. Okay, So again, a little bit more complicated than this. Any questions you'll be asked will be relatively simple and uh, usually accompanied by a diagram. Okay, Okay. now back to this diagram. Notice that <coughs> um, the sine of theta, Okay, if this angle is theta right here, because sine is opposite over hypotenuse, we have that the sine of theta is lambda over 2 all over b over 2. That can refer to either, well, to this diagram right here. Okay, Or in other words, the sine of theta is lambda over b, which is, of course, what you would get if you use the big triangle here. Okay, All right, so again, this gives the first dark fringe on either side. Okay, And remember, there are many pairs that give destructive interference, and there's actually an infinite number of wavelengths. Okay, So the interference from a single slit um, will give destructive interference if B sine theta okay, equals lambda, which is just rearranging this equation right here. But because there's actually an infinite number of possibilities, we have to add an integer counter here, 1, 2, 3. Right? So really, it's B sine theta equals N lambda. Okay, where theta is the angle at which the minima are observed on the screen, and it has to be in radians, okay? So here's sort of a three-dimensional view of it, okay? So this is theta right here. You see it goes from the central minimum to the center of the, of the first um, um, negative or dark fringe, okay? All right, so B sine theta equals N lambda, okay, where theta equals the angle at which the minima are observed. Now, we're going to use a small angle formula, which you guys are familiar with. We've talked about it before, okay? If theta is really small, then the sine of theta is approximately equal to theta if it's in radians. So we can say that theta equals lambda over b, and this is the case for obviously n equals 1. You see how this equation comes from that equation, all right? Um, in the IB, uh, to simplify things, we just we just we state them as being equal. So lambda equals, or sorry, theta equals the wavelength divided by the the slit width. Okay, and the sling, single slit diffraction pattern, of course, looks like this, right? And you're going to see a lot of graphs of intensity on the y-axis. Typically, uh, the units won't be there, so we'll be talking about relative intensity. But the point is, on the x-axis, you're going to see the angle at which the the um, the fringes sort of fan out or spread out. Okay. You're going to need to know eventually about circular apertures, not at this point, but you will. Um, and for circular apertures, there's a slightly different equation, and that is that the angle is 1.22 times the wavelength divided by the slit opening. And the 1.22 um, comes from a calculus derivation, and it has to do with the fact that the aperture is a circle. Okay. And it has to do with the average width, where the width of the circular hole varies from 0 to a diameter b. Um, anyway, you don't obviously you're not going to have to um, derive that, but you'll be given both of these equations in your data booklet. Okay, so again, uh, in this section 9.2, we're only talking about single slits. We're not talking about circular singular apertures. Okay, okay. So typical intensity uh, against angle graph would look like this. Okay, right. So this corresponds to something like this. Kind of looks like a dartboard, doesn't it? Okay. Um, and this is obviously for a circular aperture. You can see the figure, um, the pattern on the screen. Okay. So you can see the first minimum is that is that lambda equals or theta equals lambda over b. Okay. The second would be two times that. The third would be three times that. So it's quite easy um, to see the pattern. And obviously, because they're integer multiples apart, you're going to get the same distance. The, the, the widths of the bright and dark uh, fringes are going to be the same. They're going to be constant, right? Because they're integer multiples of one another. OK, uh, it, something that's just kind of interesting that you don't have to know is this idea called an airy disk or an airy pattern. You should look this up on Wikipedia. It's super cool. Um, 
It, this, it actually, this is from a circular opening, and this is um, theta equals 1.22 lambda over b. We'll actually give this in three dimensions. Pretty cool stuff, okay? All right, so here's an example that we can do together. Go ahead and try this one, okay? Uh, I'm going to walk you through how to solve this problem uh, in, a, in a typical IB problem-solving fashion, okay? So we have light passing through a slip. It's shining on a flat screen. This diagram is clearly not to scale, okay? So the, the angles theta and these distances x and even b are all exaggerated in order to show you the geometry. But the, uh, the screen is located 40 centimeters from the slits. The wavelength is uh, 410 nanometers. And the distance between the midpoint of the central bright fringe and the first dark fringe is x. Determine the width of the central bright fringe when the width of the slit is is 5 times 10 to the minus 6 and half that, okay? Okay, so here's how we do it. We say that lambda or theta equals lambda over b, but that's actually equal to x over d because really this is sine theta. So this equation right here, let me circle it for you. This equation right here is actually the one that you will use for problem solving all the time, okay? Um, so remember, this is really actually sine. Now, you might be saying, well, if it's sine, it should be this over the x over the hypotenuse. Well, guess what? Little d is so big compared to, um, compared to x that essentially the hypotenuse and the adjacent sides are the same length, right? And of course, that was the whole thing behind the small angle formula that we did when we said that sine theta equals theta, okay? So we can say that, and that, and that actually makes, makes the mathematics a lot easier. Instead of having to figure out the length of that side, it would, be, it would be so small as to not make a difference, okay? So in this case, um, I'm going to solve for x, and I solve for x, and I get that it's 0 0.0328 meters. But of course, the width of the fringe would be two times that because it's this whole distance right here. That's what they're asking. Um, so it would be 0 0.066 meters. Now, if I decrease the wave, um, if I decrease the width of the slit, okay, you can see that theta is gonna is gonna be bigger because b is in the denominator of that fraction, right? So therefore, um, therefore, it should spread out more, okay? And in fact, when you repeat the calculation, you get that the width of the fringe is, um, is 13 centimeters, quite a bit bigger than it was before, okay? So that's an example of how we do this kind of problem solving. Okay, here's another one. A single slit of width 1.5 uh, micrometers, okay, that's, that's times 10 to the minus 6 meters, is illuminated with light of wavelength 500 nanometers. Find the angular width of the central maximum, okay? Pretty simple stuff, right? Just remember, um, you, can, you can either express it in terms of radians or degrees, right? This, this equation only works with radians, so if you want to go back to degrees, you have to, you have to make that, um, you have to fix that later, okay? Um, so the width, of course, is two times that, so it's 0.66 radians or about 38.2 degrees, okay? And here's uh, one more. Microwaves of wavelength 2.8 centimeters fall on a slit. And the central maximum at a distance of one meter from the slit is found to have a half width. Okay, I expect you to be able to understand that. Of uh, 67 centimeters, find the width of the slit. Again, the mathematics is not difficult. For me, it always helps to draw a picture. Okay, um, even if it's kind of the same picture that you draw every single time. Theta equals lambda over b, which is x over d. And then in this case, you solve for b, and I got that it's 4.2 cent a 4.2 centimeter slit. Okay, all right, and I think this is the last example I'm going to do for you. Example four, so the intensity pattern for a single slit diffraction is shown, okay? And remember, the vertical units are arbitrary. This is the kind of graph you're going to see a lot more of in the next section. Find the width of the slit in terms of the wavelength of the light being used, okay? All right, so if you imagine that you're standing back behind the light source and you're looking towards a screen, and this is what you would see, this is kind of a three-dimensional rendering of how theta fans out to the right. It actually fans out to the left, too, over here, but we're, we're most interested, and we only have to deal with one side of it, okay? So you can see that the angle between the central maximum and the first minimum is 40 degrees, as given in this diagram, okay? Well, I have to convert 40 degrees to radians in order to use this equation right here, as usual, and then I just solve for b, and I get that b is actually one, almost one and a half times the wavelength. Okay, um, so if I, obviously if I'm given the wavelength, I can come up with the numerical answer for B, but that's not required for this particular example. 